good morning, all. Welcome to worship here at Grace Church. Uh, whether you're joining us in the worship space or whether you're joining us online, which is our second campus, we are excited that you are here this morning. We got some great stuff going on. So the first thing we've got going on, as you all know, our 15 people just returned from our mission trip. So would everybody that was on the mission trip just stand up for a minute. All right. One at a time, I don't care how you do it, can you yell out a word or a phrase that described the trip? Hey, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Laughter. Laughter. Fun. Fun. Unimaginable. Unimaginable. Church. Church. Amazing. Amazing. Carrie leads that service, I think, in two weeks. Correct, Carrie? Yes. Yeah, so praise God you had a great time and that you're all back safe and that the ride was uneventful. A <laughs> <laughs> couple of other things we want to talk about before we get started this morning. We've got four new members who are going to be joining our church again this morning. You probably saw the cake outside in the hallway with all the other goodies. Uh, there is a centerpiece in your bulletin that you can pull out in a little bit. And uh, we will talk about that as we welcome them into our church. If you're joining us online, you can find that same information at PainesvilleGrace.org. Uh, that would be Nathan is joining us, Lasso, Jess Karpinski, and Kurt and Holly Gregerson. So we're pretty excited for those four. Uh, we will be celebrating their uh, joining us a little bit later in our service. And then one other thing I wanted to bring to your attention in that same centerfold uh, there's a piece that is in the red box, and it says missional opportunity. So let's take a look at this. It says, beginning on Sunday, August 13th, and continuing through September 3rd, we're going to be exploring the topic, faith after doubt. Thinking about why our beliefs stopped working and what we did about it. We would like to invite you to share your story, perhaps a time in your life with your faith, that caused you to seriously start to doubt. Perhaps you became disillusioned with your faith, perhaps you took a pause from your faith, or perhaps you're still in that space of doubting. So we'd like to invite you to share your story during the worship service, uh, those four worship services that will happen during that time period. You can either do it in person, we can pre-record you if that is more comfortable for you, or use any other kind of media source that you might choose. Also, if you would prefer that your story remain anonymous, um, I am certainly welcome to read it for you. So if you would let me know by the end of July if that is a space that you'd like to step into and share your story. Um, those, I think, are our announcements. You know what we haven't done, at least for a full week, is we haven't gotten up and greeted each other with the love of Christ before the ringing of the bell. So we've got new faces in our worship space today all over the place, so please stand up and greet each other with the love of Christ.
body and join us in our opening praise songs. Like a deer that pants for water, I am thirsty for you, Lord. Yet in my heart there is a longing. I still believe there's more. So open up the heavens and let your spirit fall like rain. Refresh my life again A hungry heart is what I bring To the table of a king For there my soul is satisfied With all the goodness he provides
Lord, we thank you for placing your wonderful, powerful, protective peace in our lives. We are grateful that you have positioned your peace to stand at the entrance of our hearts and in our minds, and that it dominates our minds and can control our lives. Because what is inside of us, that is what rules us. Guide us so that we can choose to let our hearts of peace rise up and to keep our hearts of war silent. With this peace standing at the gates of our hearts and minds, we know we can be assured that it will disable Satan's ability to attack our emotions and it will not permit the lies and the accusations to slip into our minds, through our bodies, and out of our mouths. Thank you for loving us to put this powerful peace into our lives. We pray this in the name of the risen Christ. And now, please take a few moments to lift up your silent prayers. Gracious God, we take all those prayers that we have spoken aloud and those that we have lifted up silently, and now we lift up to the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray over 2,000 years ago. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, would our children please come forward, or those who are young at heart, for our young people's message? Hey guys, how's everybody doing this morning? Pretty good, that's good. Hello, hello. Here, let's move down. We gotta make some room, come on you guys. We can skinny up, a little bit further. There you go, we got it. All right, so we're gonna talk about a heart of peace today. P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace. Does anybody know what the word peace means? Or when you hear that word, what do you think about? Mm -hmm. Quiet, we do. We hear about quiet. Freedom. Freedom, okay. Anything else that when we think of peace? Okay, those are two great definitions. So, you see this heart behind me? Behind all of us, actually? Here, let me get out of your way. You can see it better. All right, anybody know where that heart came from? Where did I find that from, that big piece of art? You guys have been in my office. It was hanging in my office. Yep, so I just borrowed it from my office and I brought it out here. So look at all those different colors. So as you look at those colors, think about which one is your favorite color. Amen. All right, so now you're going to holler out your favorite color for us. Of all of the colors on that piece, what's your favorite? Yellow, red, green, red, blue, green, red, green, and what do you guys think? Orange. All right. And you know what? My favorite color on there is purple. So isn't it interesting that we, many of us have a different color? 
So we sort of disagree on what our what the, our favorite color is because we all have different ones, correct? Yes. All right. And what does Mr. Giraffe think? What's his favorite color? Blue. Cool. All right. So here's my question: Would it be very nice if I said to you guys, "You guys all have to have my favorite color. Your color has to be purple. Period. The end." There's purple, yep, right there. Would that be very nice if I said that to you guys? No. And what if one of you guys said to the other person, well, that's a stupid idea. You need to like my color better. Would that be very nice? No. What else would not be very nice if we said it to each other about the colors on that piece of art? Can you think of anything else that wouldn't be very nice? Okay, we probably covered all the not nice things. All right, so here's my next question. Everybody gets to take a piece of pink paper. There you go, there you go. You wanna hand those all down that way so everybody has one? All right, so what does that piece of paper say on it? Can somebody read that for me? And it, let's see, it goes like this. There you go. WWJD. Anybody know what that means? Pardon? JV. You're very close. It means, what would Jesus do? WWJD. So it's kind of an acronym or a short version of what would Jesus do. So as we think about the piece of art behind us, and as we think about all of our differences with our favorite colors, what do you think some of the things that Jesus would say to us about all those different colors and the fact that we don't agree? They would, he would say what? They're all good colors. Yep, that's what Jesus would say. Anything else that Jesus might say? Were we all created the same? Do we all look alike? No, we don't look alike. I don't look like you guys. Thank heavens you don't look like me. <laughs> no, we all look different, and God created us all different. So it's okay to have differences, but how do we have to act when we have differences? With our hearts of peace. With our hearts of peace. Yeah. And we need to talk nicely to each other and not be mean. Why? Because what would Jesus do? All right, how about if we were gonna do a one, two, three, and we're gonna holler it out just as loud as we can so everybody in the way back can hear it. What would Jesus do? That's what we're gonna holler, all right? Ready? One, two, three. What would Jesus do? All right, good job. How about if we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help remind us every day to have hearts of peace, even though we disagree, even if it's on the colors of our piece of art, and to remind us to ask the question, what would Jesus do? Amen. So what I'd like you guys to do is take these home and you put them up in your room or in your house or wherever you put your uh, special pieces of art to help you remind you every day, what would Jesus do? Thanks, you guys. Have a good one. You can head back. I forgot to ring the bell. Did I really? <laughs> can you ring the bell to start our service since we're already into it? Here it is. Thank you for the great reminder. Please join us in our another praise song. There's something written on your heart. It's the guiding force in your life. And when the storms of life come, the writing comes to the surface. Your story and all of its baggage is written on your heart. But there's another story. And God says that we are to write it on our hearts. The Bible. 
66 books with over 30,000 verses. Now that sounds like a pretty tall order, but Jesus' life provides the perfect example of scripture that is etched on the heart. When Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness, his response is straight out of Deuteronomy. On his way to being crucified, Jesus continues to quote scripture. And finally, as Jesus surrenders his spirit, he quotes Psalm 22. His father's words were on the front of his mind and on the tip of his tongue at every moment. But Jesus didn't just know the scriptures, he lived the scriptures. They weren't just words on a page to him. They were the foundation upon which he built his life. And God invites us to do the same. But Jesus said something pretty shocking about the scriptures. He confronted a group of religious leaders who were trying to earn eternal life by studying the scriptures and said to them, you're looking in the wrong place. The scriptures all point to one thing, me. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So don't think that the scriptures lead to eternal life. They don't. They lead to Jesus, the author of eternal life. And studying them is not about knowing a bunch of nice sayings. It's about knowing a person, Jesus. To know Jesus is to know scripture. And to know scripture is to know the heart of the Father. For it contains the very words of God. His words were meant to become a part of you, to course through your veins, to be lived out. Something is written on your heart, and it's either your words or God's, either your story or God's story. So may you find your place in God's story. May you delight in his word. And may that word be forever written on your heart. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you this morning, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we're going to be hearing the second message in our series following the book entitled The Anatomy of Peace, Resolving the Heart of Conflict. Has anyone actually per, uh, purchased the book or downloaded it onto one of your favorite devices yet? Raise your hands. Yeah, we do have a couple people. Otherwise, the rest of you guys are just doing the cliff notes, which I'm absolutely fine with also. By the way, I would be your cliff notes. <laughs> so last week, we learned how the book has been read and studied by folks all over the world. Uh, folks who wanted to learn how to work through conflict in a much more loving and a peaceful way and a way in order to come into conflict, which we all have, and disagreements. Conversations where we know they're going to be kind of explosive. We're going to have some collision going on. Conversations where we know we're going to experience conflict. And how we come into that conflict with a heart of peace versus a heart of war. Because don't we all know conflict happens everywhere? Conflict happens in our home. It certainly happens in our communities, in our workplaces, and yes, conflict even happens in our churches. So today, we're going to be unpacking what it means to have a heart of peace versus a heart of war. So in other words, when you enter conflict, how do you enter conflict with a heart of peace and not the heart of war? So we're going to take just a minute this morning to define what it means to have a heart of peace. So when we come into conflict with our heart of peace, we're going to choose to see the other, whether the other is our children, our spouses, our friends, our neighbors, our community, our colleagues, even strangers, how we see those people just as we see ourselves. So we see these people, or the other folks, we see them as people who have needs and cares and fears and realities just like we do. So let's say that again. We're going to see those other people that we're going to come into conflict with just as people who have the same hopes, needs, cares, and fears that are just as real to them as they are to us. 
So we decide in our minds that either they count or they don't count. And since we regard others as ourselves, we say that we're going to come into that conflict with our heart of peace. Now, the opposite of a heart of peace is having a heart of war. So when we come into conflict with a heart of war, we see others as obstacles, vehicles that we just want to get out of the way. We see them as wrong, or maybe we even see them as irrelevant. They don't count like we do because we've already systematically said they're inferior and we're superior. And when we come into conflict with our hearts of war, we can't see through situations very clearly. We consider others as being wrong, out there, off to left field, out to right field, it doesn't matter, but they don't match into our system of beliefs. And when we think of people and go into conflicts with our heart of war, we're gonna talk about that, by the way, a lot more next week, we come up with some really bad behaviors which cause really bad situations. So, what would Jesus do? WWJD. So what does Jesus have to say about a heart of peace versus a heart of war when we come into situations? So that's what we're going to answer in today's scripture reading. But I want to put our scripture reading today in a little bit of context before we actually read it. So, before the scripture in the Bible, it talks about Jesus has shared his last meal with his disciples and all of his followers there in the upper room. We don't know in whose house it is, and it really doesn't matter. They're in an upper room, men and women, and they're celebrating the Last Supper. Jesus has already shared Holy Communion with them. He's done the feet washing. He's taught them how to be true leaders and servants and how to serve each other and how to serve all of humankind. Jesus has also predicted that Judas would be the disciple who would betray him, and that later Peter would deny knowing Jesus three times. So he's already called those two out. All in the room must have felt pretty doggone uncomfortable, conflicted, confused, and certainly, I'm sure, very anxious. So Jesus knows what lies ahead for them, for all of them, and it's going to be very uncomfortable. It's going to be a horrific evening with horrific results. So he decides to lead them into the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus needs to spend time with his Father. He needs to commune with his Father. And he needs to start wrapping his mind around the events that are just about to happen. He needs to prepare himself and his people. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples after prayer. And here is where our scripture begins. So please listen closely to the scripture as Jesus demonstrates his heart of peace as he's going into those contentious times. Today's scripture reading is Luke chapter 22, verse 47 through 53, found in the New International Version. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man was called Judas. One of the twelve was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Here ends today's reading. So in that scripture reading, we're told that Judas comes up to Jesus while he's speaking to the crowd. 
I'm thinking that we could probably safely surmise that maybe Judas even interrupted Jesus, perhaps even mid-sentence. And you heard the story. Jesus didn't rebuke the interruption. He simply asked the question. Jesus asked, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And you see, with that question, Jesus invites Judas into the conversation. But before the conversation can even get started, we've got one of Jesus' followers asking if he could use and strike with his sword. And before Jesus could even answer that question, the follower strikes the servant, cuts off his ears. His ear, not his ears, just one ear. And what does Jesus say? The scripture read, but Jesus answered, no more of this. No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. You see, Jesus understood that the servant whose ear was cut off was most likely only following orders. And in the book of John, remember the Bible, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth gospel, John, John even takes care to record the servant's name. And we learn that the servant's name is Melchus, M-A-L-C-H-U-S, Melchus. So Melchus, in all probability, was a temple guard under con the control of the high priest. And he was probably a personal representative of the high priest. He was probably sent there to accompany the officers so that they made sure that the job got done correctly and according to plan. So Melchus. Perhaps Melchus was called back to work after supper with his family. Perhaps he had a wife. Maybe he had some kids and some grandkiddos around. And perhaps they'd all just finished their meal and now they were gonna rest and relax. And bam, 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 knock, knock on the door. Melchus is called up to do the work. You see, Jesus and John knew that Melchus was a person. A person with hopes and needs, dreams and cares and fears, just like the followers of Jesus. He was just doing his job. And did he deserve to have his ear chopped off? Well, apparently Jesus didn't think so, because he touched the man's ear and he healed it. So let's take a moment to do just a little bit deeper dive on the story. You see, that healing action of Jesus may very well have been one of the last miracles that Jesus performed before his death. Melchus could have been the last human being able to feel that kindly touch of Jesus where those life-giving hands not only healed him, but they gave him new vitality, new life. The powers ran through his body, flowed through him, and changed Melchus for life. Might Melchus and his family have become believers as a result of that experience? Well, it's certainly more likely that they would have become believers once Melchus returned home after they heard that story and saw his ear healed and put back on his head. They may not have been so interested in believing about Jesus or believing that story had Melchus come home with his ear gone, maybe in his hand, uh, and things not looking so good. So you see, Jesus knew the best and the most productive way of being in conflict with the heart of peace, even in those super, super highly charged moments. <laughs> so now our question is, what would Jesus do? But the bigger question is, what will you do? What will you do when you come into conflict? Will you bring your heart of peace when somebody comes up and gets in your face and talks about the exact political viewpoint that you've got. They talk about the candidate that you're not particularly supporting. Will you bring your heart of peace to that conversation? What if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I mismanaged my money, I blew it, and now I need to borrow money from you. Will you bring your heart of peace to that conversation? How about if they come up to you in school 
and they start the whole bullying process, or they're bullying your friends, will you be able to bring your heart of peace to that conversation? How about if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I got a great idea for you. You ought to do this, you ought to look like that, and by the way, you ought to wear this, or you ought to act this way. I see lots of smiles on that one. <laughs> will you be able to bring your heart of peace to that conversation? Or lastly, how about if your kiddo comes up to you at whatever age and says, or grandkiddo, I got a big old drug problem and I need your help with it and I need it now. Will you bring your heart of peace to that conversation? It's just a small list. Some of you could probably relate to some of it. Some of you might be able to relate to all of it. Some of you might think to yourself, you know, I know it's coming down the pike, and I don't know how to deal with it, but maybe we can think about dealing, it, dealing with it with our heart of peace. So Jesus, in this particular scripture reading and in this parable, and there are certainly millions of them in the Bible, we just happen to select this one, shows us how we share our space with others and the planet that God put us on. God created us to be in the image of Christ, and certainly he created us all uniquely different. I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I actually see God's sense of humor. Anybody else see that in the mirror when they look in there? Yeah, God does have a sense of humor. And we do all look different. So the takeaway from this morning, the takeaway is that conflict is a given. We can grow, we can love, we can come closer to each other, and clearly we can come closer to God through conflict. With that being said, we just have to try to remember to come into conflict with our hearts of peace. A heart that says we choose to see the other as we see us and as we see ourselves. Whether they're our children, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues, our strangers, or people at our jobs. We see all people as children of God, created in the image of God. That would be what we call ourselves Christ-like. We see all people as children of God, created in Christ's image, and we see all people, people who care and love and hurt and move through the planet, just like we do every single day. And that, my friends, is what Jesus would do. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, a special time for us this morning. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, from time to time we experience a new beginning in our faith journey. And the Holy Spirit breaks into our lives and does it very differently, inspires us, and leads us to deepen our commitment to Christ. And this morning, today, we can praise the Lord that that's what's happening in the life of Nathan, and Jess, and Kurt, and Holly. So would you four please come forward with me? The rest of you are going to partake in the service also, so grab out your insert and find the spot where it says, uh, Welcome New Members. Come on up, my friends. All right, so I'm going to ask these folks some questions, and they're hopefully going to say, I do. And then I'm going to turn around and ask you folks some questions, and hopefully you will say, we will. So here we go. Do you fall? Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject evil, injustice, oppression in whatever forms they present in our world? You do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust and grace and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened up to people of all ages, sexes, ethnicities, and races. You do. According to the grace given you, are you prepared to be trained and equipped to become the hands and feet of Jesus in our neighborhood and in our world and to help the needs of others through the powerful love of God? You will. All right, here's your part, congregation. Do you, as the body of Christ, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We will. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include these persons now in front of you 
before you in your care and in your love and in your training. We will. All right. So now you can pull out your insert and let us profess our Christian faith together. Do all of you guys remember the Apostles' Creed? It's okay if you don't. You've got it written right there. <laughs> and you guys all have it in your bulletin. So please join me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, heaven and, heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. How about a round of applause for these folks? All right, and you know the drill. Two of you I want to head down that direction, and two of you I want to head down this direction in the aisle. You folks are all going to stand up. You're going to appropriately put your hands on each other and or these people, and we are going to bless them. Or if you can't reach them, you put your hand on the person next to you. All right, everybody in the back good to go? Here's our blessing. May the Holy Spirit work within each and every one of you so that you feel blessed and become a blessing to those around you as faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can all be seated, and now we can sing our next praise song.
Thank you for your sustained commitment, and thank you for your extravagant generosity. Would our ushers please come forward for our offering?
May your light shine brightly in the seasons of darkness. May God bless you in the season among us that the world might know that through you and through all of us, the great love, grace, and justice of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Have a fabulous week.